Uh, on this bill, Mr. Chair, I'm looking forward to your counsel and guidance. Um, colleagues, some people just <clears throat> just uh, cannot take care of themselves. And we're leaving them to the elements out on our streets. And that's our current solution. And, and that's inhumane. And it's unconscionable. Bringing them into a supervised environment is also expensive. Mentally ill individuals on our streets have been a tragic consequence of the shortcomings of the Lantram and Petrus Short Act. I don't have all the answers. <clears throat> I do know that SB 640 provides an obvious one, and I'm not the first to propose it. The big question is whether our current private sector hospital partners are ready for a better definition of gravely disabled and the potential of conservatorships landing in their halls and rooms or new facilities designed for this medical niche. Mr. Chair, thanks for holding an appreciation for this juxtaposition of doing what's right and doing what's feasible under the current paradigm. This past Sunday, the Sacramento Bee had an editorial that was a submission that was provided by a Nancy Weaver Tyker to, to was titled, For Mentally Ill Homeless People, Escaping Life on Streets Can Be Hard. The piece details the difficulty of finding Sandy a room. On April 2nd, Kaiser announced California hospitals see massive surge in homeless patients by Philip Reese. Coming from Orange County, we have a unique model. <clears throat> if a homeless person is released from a hospital, we have a nonprofit by the name of Illumination Foundation, which provides recuperative rooms and beds, and then they locate supportive housing, and then they are followed by permanent HUD housing. We have a pipeline, but this pipeline has to be replicated throughout the state of California. Consequently, to reach the intended goal and to do it with sufficient resources, I'm proposing a few items. Number one, that Lanterman is broken. Even the Steinberg Institute has requested the Joint Legislative Audit Committee for an audit of the Act's implementation. Two, that institutionalizing certain, <coughs> excuse me, certain clinically authorized individuals is the compassionate and appropriate approach to pursue. Involuntary holds can be the most humane solution. Three, that Laura's law is being enacted in many counties after Orange County and SB 585 by Senator Steinberg back in 2013 provided a cr critical funding source and direction, but it is only a segment and not all of the 58 counties are using Laura's Law. Four, that Laura's Law may be a good starting platform for dealing with the gravely disabled as it relates to dealing with, excuse me for my throat, for disabled, oh, thank you very much, Senator Mitchell. I, think, I don't know if it's allergies or a cold. Every March something happens up here. Fragrances. Yeah, the fragrances. <laughs> 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 That's okay, I'll try and get back on track. The, the, that Laura's Law may be a good starting platform uh, for dealing with the, the court system and, and dealing with those that are considered gravely disabled. That the Mental Health Five, that the Mental Health Services Act would be a good funding source to address this critical need. Six, that no place like home is also a component in the housing for mentally ill homeless individuals. Seven, that, that my journey in addressing and providing solutions for mentally ill homeless individuals confirms just how complex and fraught our laws are in addressing the least in our society. Mr. Chair, we have the wherewithal to do something better than abandoning mentally ill persons who are unable to make the appropriate decisions to the mainstream out on the streets. SB 640 is a step in the process that should be considered now, and I have two witnesses, Lisa Ashley and Diane Shenstock. Okay, thank you, welcome, and thank you, Senator Morlock. So six minutes total between two of you, maximum, thank you. Thank you, um, Chairman Pan and Senators of the Health Committee. I am here in support of 640, the mental health bill regarding um, gravely disabled. My name is Lisa Ashley. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, but I'm here because my son is, par has a, is paranoid schizophrenic. He has been for 10 years. He's been hospitalized five times, not because he's violent, nor is he a danger to himself or others, but because he is gravely disabled. 
He has also, in addition to his serious mental illness, anisonogia, which means his disease does not allow him to know that he is ill and in need of medication and treatment. He is on no medications right now because he doesn't understand that he's ill. He has been homeless in spite of having SSI, a designated payee, Medi-Cal, in addition to my private insurance, he refuses all care. The reason I tell you this is to emphasize that the gravely disabled needs, as it is defined now under the LPS Act, does not serve individuals like my son who needs to be 5150 to be evaluated for further care and treatment. I have had the police at my home a number of times to have him taken to the hospital, only to have them often say to me, he doesn't meet criteria. They base most of that on the fact that he's not violent and he is not um, in, uh, in hurting other people or, in, or himself. His last hospitalization under gravely disabled was because in addition to his, disillusion, his delusions, he urinated in front of the officers and they finally took him into the hospital where he remained for two weeks. Handcuffed and put in the police car. This is not right. People who have serious mental illness, because they have a neurologic brain disease, which causes them not to understand that they are ill and need of help, need us, everyone in this room, to step in and help them get the help they need. The LPS needs to be reformed and brought up to date with the knowledge that we now have about the gravely disabled. disabled so family members can get their relatives help. It ought not to take the emotional pain and trauma for families to go through to get their loved ones help. We need the community support services to help keep them in care, and we need to have these services accountable. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee and Mr. Chair. My name is Diane Shenstock from Roseville, California. Um, I've been before you before last year on a s this similar issue. Um, I wanted to share with you a little bit that the catalyst for this bill actually started with myself in 2015. My son had been conserved and had met the criteria for gravely disabled for seven years. And for reasons I couldn't understand, the county decided to drop the conservatorship for four. And in those four years, my son spiraled out of control and was homeless and in and out of the jails and the hospitals. I begged the county for help. They provided to me their interpretation of the gravely disabled definition. And they said things like, if an individual is unable to pr um, adequately consume food and water while on the unit, meaning in the hospital, they didn't meet criteria. I argued that doesn't talk to the issue of providing for one's own. Apparently stealing food, which my son frequently did, or digging it out of a dumpster is acceptable. They mentioned that public nudity or inadvertent exhibitionism would cause a, a finding for gravely disabled, but wearing ripped cloth, clothing soaked in urine is okay. Um, they said that if a person is unable to maintain adequate shelter in the community due to behaviors and symptoms of a mental illness, they would then meet the criteria, but living in a cardboard box is okay. So I wasn't sure what to do. I know that this was not the intention of the law. So I turned to my legislator, uh, a legislator, um, Assembly Member Chen, and two years ago, his then ledge director uh, wrote a bill, submitted it, we felt he got it wrong. He simply added the words medical care after food, clothing, and shelter and didn't really change much else to the definition. We felt it was wrong and Assemblymember Chen did not push that bill forward. But it did get the attention of LA County. And last year, LA County then um, worked with Assemblymember Santiago and we developed AB 1971. If you remember, I was here last year in support of AB 1971. Um, 
that failed because everyone got really hyper-focused on what is the definition of medical care. And they determined that an individual had to be within six months of death before they would reach out and help them or find them eligible under this law. So the bill died then. Um, we forgot at that point to define what is food, clothing, and shelter. So in my opinion, I want to share why I think that SB 640 is an improvement over AB 1971. Um, for starters, adding another qualifier at the end of food, clothing, and shelter, such as medical care or any other qualifier you might put, doesn't affect the, the change that we are looking for. Um, AB 6, or SB 640 addresses, addresses what Lanterman Petrus and Short intended decades ago, which was to address an individual's capacity to make a decision. It doesn't change the law, it clarifies it. And anybody who is in support or in opposition of this bill is essentially stating that it's okay to continue to criminalize and incarcerate or ignore people on the streets with an illness. We don't do that with any other illness or any other segment of the population. I ask for your I vote today. Thank you. Thank you, thanks very much. Uh, other witnesses in support, in the back microphone, uh, name, organization, and position what should be support at this point in time. Hi, my name is David Bain. I'm with NAMI Sacramento, and I'm someone who lives with two brain disorders, and I support this bill. Thank you. Priscilla Kudos here on behalf of City of Santa Monica in support. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other, uh, someone coming up to the microphone, okay. Hi, Elaine Penn from um, Alameda County, and we are, I'm um, Association for Chinese, uh, Chinese Communities. So we support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one else at the microphone, uh, witnesses in opposition, if you can please uh, maybe move to the side so they can sit there. Either that corner side or that side, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. You just need to make room for a couple seats there. Or... Sorry. Okay. Okay, so uh, they went over a little, so we'll give you a little extra time if you need it, but if you don't need it, you don't have to take it. <laughs> Thank you, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kirk Child, Disability Rights, California. Uh, we are opposed to this bill for uh, many of the same reasons we've been opposed in, in various efforts that have uh, attempted to expand conservatorships without assuring that there are services and supportive housing to accompany uh, those expanded conservatorships. This bill was really, uh, I think, is premised on uh, the assumption that the current definition of gravely disabled lacks clarity. But, but what it does is substitutes a number of terms uh, in there within the definition of uh, gravely disabled um, that I think are actually overly broad and more confusing to those who are on the street who would be looking at attempting to apply the definition of gravely disabled. Uh, so you have uh, a number of terms in there, for example, incapable of making informed decisions, uh, significant psychiatric degradation, uh, even one that's mismanagement of his or her essential needs that could result in bodily harm. Uh, all I think which are overly broad. This is a definition that's been brought in from another state. The important point I think is it, within LPS in the state of California, that's a decades old uh, statute. We've uh, dealt with the definition of gravely disabled for many, many years. It's been interpreted by the courts over and over. It's interpreted by uh, law enforcement and simply substituting another definition, another set of words, doesn't do what I think uh, the, uh, the proponents of the bill would hope that it would, would do. Uh, so we would suggest um, that in addition to that, that LPS is really a complex balance. It's a complex balance to ensure that we're protecting individuals um, from danger to themselves and danger to others while respecting the autonomy and rights of, uh, of individuals not to be held against, uh, uh, against their will. And it's, it, it's 
nearly impossible to look at just one little piece of LPS without understanding the entire breadth of this statute and the balance that it has to make in protecting rights against protecting uh, uh, individuals. So for that reason, uh, Mr. Chair, we are opposed to the bill and urge a no vote. Good afternoon, Jen Flory on behalf of Western Center on Law and Poverty. Uh, we're in opposition for many of the same reasons that Disability Rights California is. And in addition, we also believe that a lot of the issues that we're seeing with conservatorships are due to the lack of upstream services that need to be provided. We have continued failings of permanent supportive housing, um, continued failings to provide the full sense of wraparound services and intensive case management that individuals need to get them back off the street and into a appropriate housing. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses in opposition? Back microphone. Mr. Chair and members, Mark Mendoza with SCIU California. I'd just like to align my comments uh, made by DRC. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members, Alex Hawthorne with the California Hospital Association. We have an opposed and less amended position. Um, we appreciate the discussion. It's an important issue to our members, um, and we thank the member for bringing it forward to have it. Um, our concern is that um, we would like to see broader reforms to the LPS Act before making a change like this. But it's the top priority for our members to address um, this issue. We will look forward to having that conversation with the Senator going forward. Okay, thank you. Seeing no one else at the microphone, uh, questions from committee members, Senator Mitchell. This is a heavy one, <coughs> Senator Morlock. Uh, I was uh, in committee uh, last year when we um, debated and agreed on some amendments on um, AB 1971. And there was an expectation that, that some continued work would be done. Um, uh, I understand that bill was not amended in the additional committees it was heard in, and then it, it died in an active file. Um, you know, I, I would just have to say that, that I have to, with all due respect, disagree with one comment you made, and that's the notion that the Lantern Petra Short Act is broken. And I think that that, while we do have a overwhelming um, issue impacting all of us across the state, uh, and represented by the two women here who talk about their own family members, but to deny the significance of that act in its 50 plus year now history, recognizing the culture within which um, it was established and how far we've come, I just don't think it's fair to say that it's broken. Um, should it require um, a, a, a new look? Perhaps. Um, and I think I, I'm concerned about a piecemeal approach to reopening um, an issue as sensitive as how we allow um, for the protection of individual rights for those with severe disabilities or mental illness. I would also challenge the opposition, as I did last year, um, that we can't dig our heels in the sand um, based on that 50 year ago history and make an assumption that any conversation about uh, adjustments to the act means that we open the flood doors and we travel back in time. I don't believe we're there either. But the years I've spent on sub one and sub three um, in dealing with, um, um, from a um, finance perspective, ways in which we support um, the severely disabled and those suffering from mental illness through the Lantern and Petra Short Act, you know, suggests to me that, that my preference would be, as you said, because a JLAC audit has been commissioned, that we wait and see. I will be very curious to see what the audit unfolds. If it presents an opportunity for us to look more broadly at the act, um, bringing all of the vested interests to the table and having a fair 2019 relevant conversation. Not to suggest that we open the floodgates to travel back in time, but also to acknowledge very real issues we are confronting in our own homes and communities and streets today. So for me, today will be a no, um, because I think that we're putting the cart before the horse. JLAC has been commissioned and audit is forthcoming. We are in the first calendar year of a two-year session. I think that there is time to see what the audit will bring forward, and it's time for the legislature will have, would have the opportunity to step up and take action accordingly. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Senator Monning. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank Senator Mitchell for her comments and insight, and I align my views similarly, but I do want to thank the author uh, for bringing this forward and for the families who are here today. Um, I know the plight of families dealing with mental illness. Um, I know the frustration of a system that is too often unresponsive or unable to respond or responds in the wrong way by criminalizing conduct that is the result of the illness. Um, so I am also going to cast a no vote today, but I think the, the lifeline here, the hope, is that we are going to have a very thorough um, uh, legislative auditor's report um, that will inform how we might best go forward in crafting remedies uh, for families, for individuals, for our communities. Uh, I want to thank those with disability rights and is it Western Center? Yes. Um, for, for your continued work on these efforts too. And I, I just want the families to know that the no vote today is not a vote in opposition to the challenge, the plight, and the pain and suffering. And I think it's shared by everybody up here on this dais. And we look forward to working with you, Senator, to finding the pathway that, that can work. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator DeRazzo. Yes, I also want to uh, thank Senator uh, Mitchell for framing this in the most positive and constructive way possible. I would add, and I'm not here the number of years that uh, others ha are or have been, but um, it seems to me in the short time I've been here, there's enormous concern and commitment to put re start putting the resources that are needed to address mental health, needed to address a lot of other issues that lead uh, people uh, to end up on the street and not know how to take care of themselves, not able to take care of themselves. So I think that's another element that should be taken into account as far as when we go, we go forward. But I, too, commit to pushing for resolution, which is, do, do, are we providing the services that are needed? And if we're not, then we've got to put much, much more in that. So I, I also thank you and the families for uh, being here today. Senator Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. Just something my colleagues said that triggered me. Um, you know, and then we have to check ourselves. Someone mentioned, you know, the construction of permanent supportive housing with, with supportive services. And I come from a city and county right now that is fighting to have them built and face opposition. You know, nobody wants it in their backyard. So it's easy to sit here in a committee and say, we have to bring the services forward until we talk about where we're going to locate them. A, and who's going to pay for them. And so we are stepping forward better and better. Cities and counties are passing initiatives to, to, to can build. And then our friends and neighbors talk about where it should be. So if we're going to have the conversation, let's be honest and have a complete conversation. Um, that if we're going to provide services to our family and neighbors and friends who need it, then we have to have the comprehensive conversation about funding and where they will be located. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, first of all, Senator Malik, I appreciate you looking um, into this issue, which of course has been, you know, we've been talking about it a lot. And, um, and uh, I think what you're probably hearing from people, and I know you've, we've just talked very briefly that Maybe it's not quite there yet, and um, but it, and we should continue the opportunity to work on it. So I, um, I'll, I guess you can comment later about maybe holding this and making a two-year bill. I, I do just want to um, uh, say to the proponents, um, um, you know, as a physician who takes care of children who have behavioral issues, um, you know, I've worked with parents who faced. Um, some of the same stories. And I think that on one level, yes, we need more support services. You know, we talk about conservators, we don't have conservators, we don't have enough housing, et cetera. Uh, but even beyond that, and I know we have to strike a very careful balance, um, uh, that even sometimes when the services are available, if the person isn't willing to partake of it, what do we do? And again, we want to respect, and we're not talking about, we don't want to take people's autonomy away, you know. 
Uh, but in some senses, what happens to your autonomy when your disease doesn't really allow you to effectively exercise it, that until it's, you're treated that you can't actually exercise autonomy, right? And we, and we have to be very careful how we do that, so I'm very sensitive to that. So, and I think that what's in the bill currently is too broad, okay? But I think there's some work that could be done, and it does need to also loop back into more resources, right? And I sort of share Senator Mitchell's experience uh, because I've uh, succeeded her on budget sub three and, you know, we talk about, you know, what kind of resources and so forth in our budget and so forth. But, but I th so we do need to tackle that. Um, but I also think there is an element as well that we need to look at Figure out: Do we make some adjustments to, uh, to to be sure that we still protect? We need to protect the rights, right? That's um, uh, and but to ensure that they have those rights and that autonomy, you need to. They, they need to be in a place where um, they have the judgment. They they are able to do that. That the mental illness does not prevent them from doing that. And I think that's why I'm hearing from the proponents that there's frustration about, and that's what I've heard. Previously, and you know that's why we have Laura's law, and people have different opinions about that and other types of things. So I'm hoping, Senator Morlock, um, I, you, you'll tell me what your decision is today. Um, that certainly, um, you know, we want us to hear from the audit, but we also want to see if we can try to get everyone together and see whether we can have that conversation. But how do we solve that particular issue? That I hear frustration coming from uh, the the people presenting today and the other supporters as well. Uh, so I mean, I think people are on both sides have expressed tremendous goodwill and desire to help. Um, can we figure out how to land th that balance there in, 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 in a slightly, hopefully better place? People may think that the current place is as good as we're gonna get, but, I, 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 but I, what I'm hearing is, is that there are families that are frustrated even when they are able, that they're not able to help. So um, with that, uh, Sarah Morlock, would you like to, uh, close or tell us what you wish to do with your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your sage counsel. I, that's what I asked for and you gave it and I really appreciate it and I want to thank Senator Mitchell as well. Um, there's one of the things, you know, when you, this, this, I've been working on the homeless issue since I became a county supervisor and even before then trying to deal with the population around the Civic Center in Orange County. And uh, it's complex. And why I did this bill, it was a result of a, a, a radio interview. And it was uh, Dr. Drew of KABC out of LA. And he said, How, this is like medieval times. What are we doing with all these people on our streets? And he's, a, I think, a trained psychiatrist. And he said, what you need to do is improve um, this definition of gravely disabled. So that's how this little chapter started. But, it, but we need supportive services. The opposition is correct. Uh, this Friday, last Friday, I was touring for three hours of facility <laughs> in Orange County to see what we can do. We've already got uh, in the city of Orange uh, a, a site that we found, and, and Senator Mitchell knows this is difficult, but we, we call it Be Well, and it'll be uh, servicing uh, the mentally ill. And uh, so we're, we're working in our region, and so, because I was involved with Proposition 2 and Senator DeLeon and I got it on the ballot, you know, uh, joint authors, you know, where you can see our, our concern, but that's a, a funding source. So, so Mr. Chair, today I'd like to request no motion. I'd like to be able to make this a two-year bill. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and I, I need to work on not your amendments that you propose, but amendments that would provide the resources to get something in place and, and maybe show a model, maybe Orange County or somewhere else. But our constituents want a compassionate solution uh, to a segment of the homeless population. I, I was born on December 21st and I've always complained that it was the shortest day, but the homeless community have said it's the longest night. And they've made December 21 the day we memorialize the homeless people that have passed on our streets. And in Orange County, it's been 200 people a year. And I'd like to reduce that statistic because people that cannot manage themselves, who cannot take care of themselves, you know, we, we've got to step up because this is not medieval times. This is 2019. And I, I appreciate very much you're allowing me to present the bill and, and for giving me the grace to make it a two-year bill, and I thank you for that. So at the author's request, we will hold this bill in committee. Okay, thank you.